Thanks, everyone. Hope you've had a bit of coffee and helped to wake up a bit in the middle of the afternoon. We, this talk is a bit away, uh, heading away from a bit of, of the real world for a minute, somewhat into la la land, um, but with, of course, real world applications because that's what we do, right? And I'm just going to be giving s or showing some results from a little experiment that we've been playing around with at, uh, at Intera with myself and the other people on the slide. Uh, looking into how would closed loop decision support modeling uh, look and sort of what are the, some of the learnings that we can learn before we actually have to go and do it in the real world. So in very general terms, I mean, I know this is a generalization, but often uh, as modelers or modeling projects will be tasked with assessing the outcome of some decision, uh, decision plan or action. Um, on a greenfield site or some site at which that action has not been taken before, so for which we have no observation of the effect of that new stress which we want to go and assess. So we'll collect data, we'll do our modeling, perhaps we'll do some optimization to figure out what's the best, uh, how best to manage our wells or how best to implement our decision. We'll give that information to our decision makers. If we're lucky, they'll say thank you, maybe pay us, go and put it into, into practice and probably continue to watch their system and see what happens. But it's usually at that stage that we kind of leave the, the loop. And um, we only get called back in when either the, the, management need, the management plan needs to be changed, or if something, if or when, probably most likely when, something goes wrong, either our model was wrong or something has changed and blah, blah, blah. But this, this process is, is slow. It can take several years, depending on how frequently the decision is revisited or how long it took for the model to be wrong or to be known to be wrong. And it doesn't make use of this high value data, which is the observation of the response of the system to this new stress which we've just implemented. So we, we are asking ourselves, well, what if we speed this up? Oh, and of course, if you want to be like Austin, that's how you'd enjoy living. Um, we asked ourselves, what if we speed this, this uh, decision loop um, up, making it faster, rather than waiting until we need to re revisit our, our question or our management system, or if it goes wrong, let's immediately assimilate that new data that we're collecting anyway, revisit our modeling, revisit our optimal decision, and potentially even update our decision. Now we live in the data age, access to uh, new and high quality data is getting easier and easier. Processing that data is also becoming easier and it's also becoming easier to automate all of these processes. So it becomes more and more realistic a scenario in which you can have a semi-automated system of data collection, uh, data simulation, data opt um, management optimization, and updating of your management plan. So we were implemented this little test case to see if we could show that by doing it at a faster rate, we could have a quicker response to new information because we're reducing uncertainty at an earlier stage and potentially start catching problems earlier and identifying opportunities sooner, which is what we'll focus on in this talk. So we implemented this for a very simple dewatering problem, synthetic case. Um, this is a very simple system in which we have recharge coming in on one side, discharge coming out of a spring on the other side, and we some, have some hypothetical um, mine pit which we want to go and dig here in the middle, and we want to keep that mine pit dry. To do so, we have four dewatering wells, but we just want to know how much, how much do we need to pump from those dewatering wells to keep the pit as dry as possible. Oops. So these four points around are the dewatering wells. And so we want to decide on what pumping rates at each of those wells do we need to do? Do we need to um, keep going so that we can minimize the, the amount of water that will flow into our pit? But we also want to save money. We don't want to pump too much. So we want to be right at this point of the decision curve or the trade off curve at which we are keeping the pit inflow as minimum as possible, but also not pumping any more than we need. And because we are the kips of this universe, we are risk averse. And so we want to be within the 
reliability that we will be at the minimum pit inflow rate uh, or pit inflow rates will never be higher than what we're predicting. So to test this, we built two models. Um, you've seen a few cases like this so in the, the talks over the last few weeks, uh, the last week. Uh, the first one is a somewhat complicated model. It represents reality. It has vertical heterogeneity. It has a relatively higher grid and temporal resolution. And we use it to generate our observation data. So this is the, the real world in our synthetic case. We use that model to simulate a period of time until we want to make a decision. We collect that data, we pass it to our working model down here at the bottom of the slide, which is coarser, single layer, coarser grid, coarser time scale, uh, and represents the models that you and I would build in our day-to-day -day lives. Um, so we take that collected data, we history match our working model with IES, we pass our posterior, posterior parameter ensemble to MPES++ MOU, and optimize that trade-off between pit inflow and dewatering. Choose our point here on the far right of that uh, trade-off curve. Pass that decision back to the real world and repeat and repeat as we advance in time through cycles of time. Okay, now because we want to look at the statistical outcomes of this, we don't do this for one reality. We do it for a whole ensemble of realities. So as you can imagine, this is a whole lot of uh, model runs and passing of information from one model run to the next. So everything is, of course, scripted. I'm sorry, Python, John. Um, using PyEMU, FlowPy, et cetera, et cetera. OK. So I'll just take you briefly through one reality. And here what we're seeing is the trade-off curve for uh, reality one. Let's call it reality one. Uh, before we implemented our decision. So we collected data, assimilated it, carried out our optimization, got this nice little trade-off curve. We gave this, this trade-off point, or this optimal choice to our, deci our decision maker, um, who then went impl implemented in the reality model, and we collected data, passed to the next cycle, and boom, we have this huge decrease in uh, required dewatering to maintain a much lower forecasted pit inflow. So what happened here is we assimilated a whole bunch of new information just from observing the effect of, or simulating the, the information of observations after the effect of that, of implementing that new stress, that pumping for dewatering. And we advance another cycle of time. And again, huge decrease in, in uh, forecasted dewatering rate. So just, this is just highlighting the amount of, of useful information that you get from that initial, um, or the observation of that initial effect of a new stress to the system. And as we keep going through, through time and advancing another decision cycle, and so on and so on, we get diminishing returns, uh, but still continuously uh, improving, or reducing our forecasted dewatering, or our required dewatering rates. So there's two things happening here. We're saving a whole bunch of money because we know we can pump a lot less. Um, but we're also saving or opening up a lot of, uh, uh, freeing up a lot of resources because we know that we can uh, expect, at the worst case, we can expect a lot less pit inflow. So now we can send the resources that we might be needing to deal with that to something else and make our system a lot more efficient or our mine management a lot more uh, efficient. <clears throat> okay, so that's one reality, it's all very nice. But now we go to another reality. Once again, we start with our pre-mining or pre-dewatering um, Pareto curve. And this time, Odo, or Rotro, as Katie would say. We're now increasing our required dewatering rates. So what, what on earth is happening here? Now I'll admit to an embarrassing long time of trying to find the bugs in my code which didn't exist. So I thought this was something I was doing that was stupid, but it turns out it's actually a feature and not a bug. Um, what's happening here is that the shape of that Pareto front is changing as we change our, or as we update our uncertainty. So when we start off, we have this nice, this nice little curve here. Then we simulated data. We're doing our trade-off, but we're also uh, uh, imposing our chance offsets. And our chance offsets between this one and this one are quite different. Well, not quite different, just slightly different. 
enough to, be, to make that slope a bit more uh, shallow. And because our naive decision maker, and here our naive is it's just an algorithm or a, f a function saying choose the point that's furthest on the right, isn't really applying any critical thinking. It just goes for that value. But we, because we've just shifted that chance function slightly, that, that new value is all the way on the right, uh, even though there's a very small change in that angle. And we can see that a bit closer here. And I'm just, so the gray, the gray area is the, uh, chance offset, so the uncertainty that we are applying to our Pareto curve. And here at the bottom, we're just zooming in to that little, that little edge as it hits the, the x-axis. And you can see here, this very small change in that slope is enough to create that, that unfortunate uh, increase in pumping rate rather than decrease in pumping rate. But if you do look at, um, so that's because of our naive decision maker, ah, sorry. But um, you do see that even if you had stayed at the same pumping rate, you would have increased your situational awareness quite a lot. You would be able to, uh, or you know to expect a lot less potential pit inflow. So this, this, um, this sort of highlighted to us some things that we knew but we were avoiding thinking about, I think, <laughs> Jeremy. <laughs> which was that um, decision variables uh, can be highly coupled to their, their parameter uncertainty. And I shamelessly, shamelessly stole this slide from Jeremy's workshop, and he shamelessly stole my results for the workshop, so there you go. Um, so what, you, what you're seeing here on, on this plot on the right, it, it's essentially the same thing that I was showing before, but here we are seeing the green, the green dots are our simulated, um, uh, essentially the, the Pareto front, and then the, the gray dots are our are an ensemble of parameter of our uncertain parameters. So you can see the uncertainty around that that decision point, and we are choosing to offset it by by uh, ninety five percent. So we are offsetting our Pareto front to the purple dots, and you can see as you change your pumping rate, that uncertainty changes. If you're all the way here on the left, you're pumping very little, the parameter uncertainty dominates. If you're all the way here on the right, you're pumping a lot, the pumping rate takes over and the parameter uncertainty becomes very uh, inconsequential. Now, this is great if you're actually assessing your uncertainty along that Pareto front, um, but we often don't. So in, in this case that I'm showing here, we've assessed the uncertainty at each of these points along the curve, but we often take shortcuts. We'll, we'll assess that as uncertainty at one point and propagate it along the entire Pareto curve, which is what you are seeing here. Right, the width of that curve is, is it doesn't look like it's an optical illusion, but it's the same thickness as we go along. So shortcuts can be dangerous, uh, but again, if you're like Austin, that's fine. Um, so this was just a little aside on parameter and uh, decision variable coupling that you should be careful of or be aware of when uh, undertaking optimization under uncertainty. Coming back to our little synthetic problem. So unfortunately that second case in which we actually increase our pumping rates in the first decision cycle was the most frequent. But e even so, uh, as soon as we get to the next decision, decision cycle, our optimal pumping rates have decreased a lot. Sorry, I didn't explain, this is a box plot of the relative dewater, total dewatering volume as we advance through, um, through our decision cycle. So at the first decision cycle, they're all one. And then here we can get either more or less, but as we go forward, our uh, forecasted dewatering volume is a lot less, bumping down to about a 60% uh, savings by the end of our life of mine, or a hypothetical life of mine. And the same happens for um, the situational awareness in terms of the pit inflows, except that here we're immediately uh, decreasing it significantly and carry on. Okay, so I mean, no surprise here. Update your model more frequently with more data. You're going to learn new things faster. Update your decision faster. You'll probably be more efficient. I don't think that's news to anyone. Um, but the, perhaps the big surprise, I mean, of course, this is specific to this case, but we weren't really expecting such a huge benefit of 
simply um, assimilating that post-stress data within the first two decision cycles on reducing um, our, or increasing our efficiency of our management system. So I think not making use of that data in the real world is something that we should probably be thinking of. of. And whilst putting these slides together, it sort of occurred to me that you can demonstrate this with, with data worth. So it might be something, something, excuse me, something relatively simple to, to, to test and demonstrate. And as we've seen, beware coupling between decision variables and parameter uncertainty. If it's a case or in the, if it's the case that, or if you're, you have this happening in, in a problem you're, you're, um, you're trying to apply optimization to, the, the outcomes can be somewhat unintuitive. And well, yeah, shortcuts are great, but they can also be dangerous. And of course, it's very nice to play around in a synthetic sandbox. But in the real world, implementing all of this will, of course, have a bunch of challenges. The, technicals are pro the technical ones are probably the least complicated. Um, designing projects that accommodate this type of update and this type of flexibility will likely be a lot more challenging. And I'm sure there are others that I haven't thought of. But just wanted to finish with this. Be friendly to your uh, open source software developers. You never know when you need to ask them a last minute favor before you get on the airplane to change the code of, of the software you're using. So thank you. <laughs> Thank you, thank, thank you, Rui. Any questions for Rui? I've actually got one. It seems to me that you could be too early, too, too, too frequent, because when you click on the wells, all the water's coming from storage, but the long-term dewatering, de when you get out to steady state, storage is no longer important. So is it true that you can get too early data that it wouldn't give you the same insight as you got in this case? Potentially, yes. I mean, that was something we wanted to explore, but the bugs in the code didn't allow it for the time, uh, was what, what the different frequencies would, uh, what, how would they matter, and whether it'd be worth it or not. Yeah, yeah. thanks. Uh, Do you include integer programming in the optimization, so mixed integer linear programming? Because I'm, I'm responding to your comment about the so project development. Sometimes times there are stair steps. Uh -huh. Right, and it actually becomes sort of an on or off for certain um, pieces of infrastructure that you might want. You know, you want two wells, or you want four wells, or yep. you have a treatment system, and now you need a treatment system with a big, bigger capacity, or, or or what have you. And it would be complicated but interesting to see if integers would in, end up included at some point. Yeah, I mean, we have not in this case. What what happens here is we're just adjusting the pumping rates, so at some point they turn off. If we were to associate a cost to implementing the well and actually be trading off in terms of cost, then you'd see, see that sort of step function and yeah. Thank you. All right, any other questions? All right, well, thank you, Rui, and thanks for hanging in there. We really appreciate it.